we, I, I, prior to today, my experience of Dr. Musi was through some CDs from the great courses on the great religions, and from this summer's read, uh, his latest book, Four Wise Men, The Lives and Teachings of Confucius, Buddha, Jesus, and Muhammad. So I'm excited to, to get it a little bit further, but it, just to tell you a few more things about him. He was born in Waco, Texas, uh, went undergraduate work at Baylor University, uh, big Southern Baptist University in Texas. He graduated summa cum laude, and then went on to pursue various, uh, several graduate degrees from Harvard, teaching in the Divinity School there. And his dissertation, his doctoral dissertation, was one I thought, hmm, we might have to have him back, Bill, for another visit. It sounded really interesting. It was on the relationship between liberalism and fundamentalism. And I thought, maybe we can get him to talk a little bit more about that. Um, pursuing his interest and fascination and, and commitment, I guess that's the word to use toward Buddhism, and this mindful journey from Waco, Texas, and Southern Baptist College. He went, um, he was in India, and Thailand, and Nepal, and Sri Lanka, um, learning and experiencing many, many things. He currently is a um, uh, professor emeritus of religion at Rhodes College. Rhodes is in Memphis, Tennessee. It has an excellent reputation in academics and is known as having the most beautiful campus in all the United States. So that's where uh, he has been hanging his hat. His wife um, also is on faculty there. She is a chemist from Sri Lanka and they have a 13-year-old daughter. Now, to get to the real information, this is what some of his students said. He assigns pointless readings about weird belief systems. No way. <laughs> Did you flunk that one? <laughs> He makes lots of good Simpson jokes. That's good. And one intends to start a cult to mer Musi worship upon graduation. <laughs> I think we're in for a really, really, really grand day. Beginning this morning with a, a bit of an introduction to Sidd Siddhartha Gautama, the Buddha, and uh, some of his beliefs as we continue to pursue our understanding of various faiths as we seek to grow our own faith. Thank you. Thank Will you. you join me in welcoming Dr. Lucy? Thank you, Linda. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's good to be here. Can you hear me fine? Is the uh, acoustics doing well? Great. I'm glad to see the uh, PowerPoint is online now. I am in a setting that I'm unaccustomed to. I'm not uh, accustomed to standing uh, 10 feet above my audience uh, or having such a large audience to talk to. I'm much more accustomed to meeting undergraduates in classes of about 15 to 18. So this is a new experience for me and I'm delighted to be here. I have been shown the greatest hospitality and I have such admiration for the mountaintop lectures and what has been done with this program and I told Bill Sailing last night that I'd like to franchise this and maybe take, take to Memphis uh, and maybe other places in the world because I think it's just exactly what we need at this moment in our history. So I'm really glad to be here, really glad to share with you what uh, I know about Buddhism and a little bit about my own journey. I find that uh, when I come to groups like this, people are always interested to know how it is that somebody from Waco, Texas, who grows up as a Southern Baptist, finds his way to teaching religion, particularly religions of uh, South Asia, which is my specialty, and practicing to some degree these religions. Now, I don't know if I would 
call myself a Buddhist. The Buddha himself uh, did not like labels. He didn't call himself a Buddhist. He called himself a Buddha, which is really quite different. So I have learned to resist labels of all sorts, and my worldview and spiritual practices drive from lots of different areas because I've studied lots of different religions. It's hard to study a religion seriously without taking something from it. So I have taken a lot from Buddhism. Uh, my wife is a legitimate Buddhist. She grew up in Sri Lanka and has been a Buddhist all her life and continues to practice that tradition. I'm a bit more eclectic, but I am very pleased to share with you what it is I do know about this tradition because it has been very attractive to me, and I think you'll find it attractive as well. Now, how did I get here? Well, I grew up as a typical kid in Waco, Texas, playing Little League and going to an elementary school. When I was eight years old or 10 years old, even 13 years old, I did not say to myself, gee, I'd like to be a professor of religious studies. That was not my goal. I did not have that in mind. In fact, I've never met a kid who thought about that. Uh, I'd be really worried if I ever met one. Uh, being a religious studies professor is not uh, a lot of folks' ambition. It wasn't even my ambition when I went to college. I was going to be a doctor. My parents wanted me to be a doctor. Uh, and so I started off. Uh, I you know, started in chemistry. I eventually added an English degree to that. I did pre-med. I got accepted to medical school. But in the last year of my college career, I began to question this faith that I had, that I had always been very committed to. I was a very religious kid, uh, even though I wanted to be an astronaut, or maybe because I wanted to be an astronaut, who knows. Uh, but I was always devout, always loved going to churches, always fascinated with Jesus, though he always perplexed me in a lot of different ways. I had a little Bible growing up, had a picture of Jesus, you know, knocking at the door, and you know that picture, and... Uh, I just couldn't figure this guy out because everybody was telling me I need to be like him. But he didn't look like a guy to me. He, he had this long hair and a beard. He looked like a woman, uh, you know, wearing a long dress and, and, and a beard. And, and yet I was told that I should model my life after him, which was fine. And I tried to do that. And then one day I just realized, wait a second, this guy's got an unfair advantage because he's God. And who am I? I'm just a kid from Waco, Texas. I can't do what he does. So I, I struggled with Jesus from a very early age and was very interested in matters of religion. Uh, when I was in late middle school, I guess about the age of my daughter now, 13, 14, 15, I got introduced to Eastern religions. And uh, I didn't know anything about them, but they became very attractive to me because I was at least aware of the fact that Waco was a very provincial place. And so I was always interested in the odd, the strange, the exotic. And so I spent a good bit of time reading a lot of this material, the Bhagavad Gita, the Upanishads, Buddhism. So I started pretty young reading this, though I never thought that this would be something that was for me. It was always something that people in other parts of the world did, and it was interesting for that reason. As I went on through high school, I got much more conservative, more evangelical, really more fundamentalist. I uh, went to Baylor, uh, which supported that fundamentalism uh, for a while, but then I began taking religious studies classes and taking a critical approach to the Bible, as you find in uh, almost every college and university across the country ultimately caused my faith to crumble. And so by the time I was a senior and ready to go to medical school, I just found my faith, my theology, my spirituality in shambles. I didn't know what to do. I was really lost, and I felt like I couldn't go on to medical school because these were important questions that I needed to have answered. So I decided to go and study a little theology, thinking that was going to solve my problem. It doesn't. <laughs> it just makes it worse. I found out that Harvard had a nice two-year program. I could go up there. I knew some of the teachers by reputation. I thought, well, this is about as far away from Waco, Texas as I could get. And so I went there, and after two years, I think I was more messed up than when I started. 
Uh, and then not knowing what to do, I just decided to continue on. I got uh, an opportunity to continue on in the PhD program. I did. By this time, my Christian faith, such as it was, was, was hard really for me to sustain. And at Harvard, there are lots of different religions that are being studied. And so there's a Center for the World Religions. And I actually got into that and started studying, re really returning to my study of Buddhism and Hinduism and Islam and so forth, and got very interested in it. And before I knew it, I had a PhD in the study of religion. And then I said, well, now what? I mean, there's, there's not much you can do uh, except either be a minister uh, or be a teacher of religious studies. So I knew I wasn't wanting to be a minister, even though, as I was telling Linda earlier and some of my hosts, I did get ordained as a Southern Baptist minister. Just don't, I, I don't like to spread that around too much, but it's, <laughs> I am. And, 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 but but um, I don't practice that too much, uh, let's say. But, you know, it's kind of hard even to get rid of it. I, I still have a great affection for the Southern Baptist, uh, even though I don't agree much with the theology that it espouses. So I go to Rhodes College to get this job offer. I was living in New England at the time, hated to leave New England and come to uh, Memphis. And, uh, but I got a job, and these jobs are hard to get when you're teaching religion. And uh, I took it, and uh, that was about 30 years ago. And uh, I just finished my teaching career there and had a wonderful time. It's a great place. It is a beautiful campus. It was one of the great perks of being there. And I had such great students. And I got to do what I wanted. I got to teach the courses I wanted. And I got to pursue my own spirituality in the way that I wanted, which is really quite a luxury and quite a privilege. I started off teaching a lot of Christian theology, a lot of history of Western philosophy. But because I've been trained in the Eastern traditions as well, uh, I was called upon more and more to do Asian religion and philosophy. So I started doing that, and that's basically what I've done exclusively since then. But I came across a great insight uh, somewhere along the way, which was that I was studying the wrong thing. And I didn't know this at the time. When I went to divinity school, I thought I wanted to be a theologian. I thought I wanted to learn about belief and doctrine and all the kinds of creeds that the church has created. But that's not what I really wanted. What I really wanted was spirituality and not theology. And it took me a long time to figure this out. But once I did, I was able then to begin to pursue my study of spirituality in a way that had not been taught to me in graduate school. Uh, the folks in graduate school and most seminaries that I'm aware of don't teach much in the way of spirituality as such. And by spirituality, I mean something very specific. I mean discipline. I mean practice. I mean the way we relate to ourselves, to the world, to nature, to other people. I think of spirituality as the realm of relationship. And that's how I understood it. And coming to that awareness was really important to me because the belief system that I had grown up under had just begun to make no sense to me. Even if I tried to believe some of the things that I had been told, I couldn't make myself believe it. And when I approached Buddhism and came uh, aware of its worldview, I learned that Buddhism thinks that belief is not that important. It's just not as important as practice. It's more important how you treat other people. It's more important what you do. It's more important how you relate to yourself and how you relate to the world. And so I was able to just kind of bracket out those problems of belief and theology and doctrine that had troubled me so long and move on to something that I found much more nourishing. And that was so liberating for me. And it was one of the things that I found so fascinating about Buddhism. And that's why I have sort of incorporated it into my worldview and find myself sort of, uh, well, I've got this little thing on my office door where people are always ask me, you know, what do you do? What, what, what's, your, what's your religion, I guess? You know, your religious studies professor, what's your religion? And you would think I'd have an answer for that. So, <laughs> but I don't. Uh, uh, except I, I came across an idea that I thought was pretty good. So I said, okay, I am 45% Buddhist and about 18% Christian, 
And I added this all up, and I included some American pragmatism. I included a bit of Sufism from the Islamic tradition. Uh, I included a bit of Hegelianism and a, a certain dose of uh, Texas redneck and, <laughs> and Rice Krispie treats and all these things. It all added up to 100%. But, but that's the way I feel about myself. I'm not a single sort of thing. And one of the great things I learned about Buddhism and really all religions in Asia is that people don't identify themselves specifically with one religion always, at least to the extent that it has uh, emerged in traditional societies. Now, now that the West has made its incursions in places like China and India and so forth, people do begin to think of themselves as being, OK, I'm a Hindu, or I'm a Confucianist, or I'm a Buddhist. But in traditional parts of those countries, still today, a person might go to a Buddhist for a specific sort of reason. They might go to a Hindu temple. They might go to a Confucian priest. They might go to a Taoist healer and not see that there's any contradiction between these things. They can embrace them all. Uh, even Muslims who live in India often practice the Hindu rituals. And Hindus themselves often observe Ramadan and prayer five times a day. It's a very different thing at the level of practice than it is at the level of theology and doctrine, the place where most intellectuals live. Uh, in fact, my wife, as I said, is a lifelong Buddhist, but today she's going to a Hindu temple where we go uh, occasionally because Buddhists in Sri Lanka go to the Hindu temples. Uh, even though the Buddha never really encouraged belief in the gods, uh, he never discouraged it either. But most Buddhists in the world, even though Buddhism is not a theistic religion, they still will go to uh, a theistic temple just to um, ask the gods for things that they need. My daughter is ha happening to... Happening to um, give a dance performance today at the Hindu temple. She studies Indian classical dance, and so that's part of why they're going there. But we go to this temple quite often, and uh, we also go to Christian churches whenever we want or whenever we find ourselves in a Muslim country going to a mosque. And I find myself being very comfortable in all of these places, even though I don't always agree with the theology or the belief system that, that's there. It's something about the sacred. It's something about the spirituality that I find in these places that's so important. OK, so that's how I got to where I am today. Let's start talking about Buddhism. Now, I'm told that uh, I could assume that not everyone knows a great deal about Buddhism. Some people may not know anything at all. So I want to start at the very beginning and talk about the man called the Buddha. And I'm going to talk uh, in this first lecture about his life. I call this lecture What the Buddha Taught. And in a way, it's not just what he taught. It's also about his life story. But his life story is what he taught. If you can understand his life and understand how it unfolded and why it took the direction that it did, you will have a great grasp of Buddhism. And then in the second lecture, I'll talk more about what he specifically said, some of the ideas that he propounded. And then in the afternoon, we will practice some of this. We will specifically look at mindfulness meditation, and I'll lead you some, through some of the exercises that take us there. So that's the uh, plan for today. Uh, I want to begin by talking about Buddha, or really as he's called, the Buddha, because Buddha is not his name. It is his title, just as Christ is the title that Christians give to Jesus. So the Buddha really was a person. There was an individual by the name of Siddhartha Gautama or you may have heard the name Siddhartha. Uh, Siddhartha, if you've read Hermann Hesse's novel by that same title, is very popular to a lot of folks. And I think it's a great novel. I think it's a wonderful novel. It's just not a novel about Buddhism. Uh, people make this big mistake. They think that the story is about the life of the Buddha, and it's not. It is about an individual who happens to be a Hindu, who is a Brahmin, who follows a path 
similar to, but not identical with, the life of the Buddha, yet ultimately comes to a lot of the same conclusions. So the novel Siddhartha is really about Hinduism at a particular time in Hindu history. And it just happened to be the same time that the Buddha lived. It's just that Hinduism came to a different conclusion about the nature of reality than Hinduism did. So in a way, Hinduism and Buddhism grow up at about the same time. They have their classical elements formed at the same time. They're responding to a lot of the same issues, particularly some of the same intellectual uh, and sociological issues. Pardon me, sociological issues. Take a drink here. And so it's into this matrix in northern India that the Buddha lived his life. Now, as best we can tell, he lived about 2,500 years ago, and he is really one of the first people that we can document historically as having actually existed that far back in history, particularly in this part of Asia. So 2,500 years, think about that as the time that he lived. Uh, as you can tell by these dates, he lived a long time, 80 years, which is kind of unusual for a religious leader. They sometimes die as early as 33 uh, or uh, you know, other times as well because sometimes people don't like what they have to say. But the Buddha lived a long life and he had a good opportunity to tell people exactly what he thought. In fact, uh, the teachings of the Buddha are much more than we find in almost any other religion. I think on my shelf, I, the sutras of the Buddha sort of occupy about this much. So it's, I don't know how many Bibles that would be equivalent to, but it's a lot. He said a lot. He gave a lot of uh, discourses and teachings and sermons and so forth, and he said a lot of different things, but they're remarkably similar. One of the things that has always struck scholars is how all these teachings of the Buddha seem to have come from a single voice. Now, you're probably familiar with the idea, well, uh, the, the Gospels were written by four different people, and you know, lots of uh, authors contributed to the creation of the Bible or even to the Analects of Confucius. But that's not true in the case of the Buddha discourses. Uh, we are pretty certain that they did come from a single individual. Now, that doesn't mean that there hasn't been changes and alterations and stuff, but the main message that we have does seem to come from an individual known as the Buddha whom has been identified as Siddhartha Gautama, this individual here. Now, what can we say about this guy in terms of his life? Well, the answer is we know that he lived in northern India. Okay, you can see that little circle there. Uh, it's a small area of India. It's just south of the Himalaya Mountains. He probably grew up in the foothills of the Himalayas. You know, it wasn't until about, a, I'd say 150 years ago, maybe 200 years ago, that scholars actually determined that the, the Buddha was from India. They didn't know about that. Uh, and even my wife, I asked her about this. Uh, I said, when you were growing up, where did you think the Buddha was from? And she said, well, I thought he lived in the village uh, over on the other side of the mountain and that he was from my father's generation. Now, I say this because history and geography is not that important to Asians in general, but specifically to Buddhists. You could probably have Buddhism without the Buddha, as long as you had the story of the Buddha or his teachings. Okay, So the historicity of the Buddha just isn't that important. It's a, it's a thing that occupies Western scholars. You know, We're interested in the historical Jesus, for instance. We spend a lot of time with that. But people don't go on quest of the historical Buddha. Uh, just not a, uh, an interesting thing. But what is interesting, of course, is his teaching. But we do know he lived in northern India. He lived in this area here. This is another map, and I don't know if you can see it very well, but uh, these little inverted Vs here represent the Himalayan foothills. He lived in this area that is kind of between the border of India and Nepal. Now, that's what we call these places today. At the time, they were not known by these terms. In fact, India is a Western term. It's only been around for about, oh, I'd say... 500, 600 years. And most Indians today do not think of themselves as India. They don't call their country India. They call it Bharat. Uh, and so that is a Western configuration to think of this 
that way. And so the Buddha did not think of himself as an Indian. He did not think of himself as a Hindu. Uh, he just thought of himself as uh, a person from the clan called the Shakyas. That was the name of his family. Uh, and uh, I'll tell you a little bit more about that family in just a moment. Uh, this part of India is represented here. It's uh, uh, the, the time of the Buddha, it was undergoing something known as the second urbanization of India. The first urbanization of India happened when a group of uh, Aryans traveled down from Central Asia about 4,000 4, years ago, and then they began to move across India into the Gangetic Plain, as it's known. And so the Buddha spent almost all of his life walking around this area represented by that green space on the right, uh, and uh, he was an itinerant individual for much of his life. He didn't start off life that way, but uh, he did end up that way as some wanderer. At this time in India, the world was in flux. Uh, and I've never really known a time when the world was not in flux. It's always more or less moving and changing, you know, but there are times of great stability, and this was a time of rapid change. Uh, new cities were being established, there was increased trade and commerce, which meant that people were encountering different people of different belief systems and cultures. There was the rise of the middle class. Uh, tradition is just kind of being questioned by a lot of people, and that makes for a very fertile time in our self-understanding, in terms of uh, our philosophy and religion. So when things are chaotic, you know, it's uncomfortable for us, but it's the time when things really change, when we can produce something very creative. You know, all the times that uh, really that kind of mark an advance in human self-understanding have been in these times of political and social chaos. And that is the time that the Buddha entered into the world. Now, in particular, what he was dealing with, and what a lot of people were dealing with, were two new ideas, and I've got them highlighted here, samsara and karma. Uh, this was part of what contributed to the, the flux, to the chaos, uh, to the ferment that was going on in this part of India at the time. Now, you may have heard of these terms. Let me just sort of mention them to you. I won't spend a lot of time on them. Samsara means rebirth. It means the idea that people are born, and they live, and they die, and then they're reborn again as uh, another life form. Now, that could be a human being. It could be uh, as an animal. It could be as a god. It could be any sort of thing. That's the idea. Uh, interestingly, this idea of rebirth was not in indigenous to ancient India. It appears only a few centuries before the Buddha himself does. So it's only been around for about 4,000 years. But Indians prior to that time didn't have any thought of rebirth. They thought when you died, that was it. You're dead. Okay. Yeah, there was some speculation. Maybe some people might go to heaven or something might happen. But around the year 2000 BCE, a group of holy men, sadhus we call them, and philosophers and thinkers were trying to figure out the nature of life. And they were really concerned with this issue of what happens to us after we die. And this was an idea that was beginning to press on people's mind all throughout the world. We see it in China. We see it in the Middle East. Uh, we see it in South Asia. We see it in Greece, ancient Greece. All at the same time, people began to wonder in a way they hadn't before, what's going to happen to us? when we died. And since no one really knew, there was a lot of speculation going on. And in India, a group of holy men and philosophers said, we think what's going to happen is that we come back to life. And they thought it was just kind of a, uh, a self-evident truth. Because when you think about it, you know, our bodies uh, dissolve, but they don't just sort of go away. They're not destroyed. They get integrated into the earth and they come back as plants and uh, the plants are eaten. So in a way, they saw the cyclical nature of human existence and they posited that as being the situation for all of us. We're all being reborn. Now, that's an idea that emerged in, in ancient Greece at just about the same time. If you go read Socrates, he talks about the same idea 
Uh, and you'll find it in various places in the world, not, not, a, not a lot. It was most prominent in India and in ancient Greece, but it was only in India that it caught on. Uh, the ancient Greeks kind of rejected the idea and they left it to the philosophers, but in India, everybody accepted this notion. And still today, all of the indigenous religions of India accept this notion of rebirth. That's Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, and Sikhism. They all believe we die and we come back to life. So you're familiar with this notion. What Hindus and the ancient Indian context added to this was the idea of karma. The idea of karma is the notion that anything that we do has repercussions that come back to us. Okay, so if I commit an act that is evil, that evil will return to me somehow and affect my life. Uh, and it may not happen right away. It may be a several years that it occurs. It may be another lifetime in which it occurs, or several lifetimes. But anything that I've done in the past is going to have an effect. I can't escape the consequences of my actions. And by the same token, when I do something good, that too is going to come back to me. So anything that I do, even if it's not seen by anyone at this moment, is going to be rewarded, I guess we could say. It's going to come back. It's going to make my life better. And so this makes for a very coherent worldview when you add it to the notion of rebirth. All right? Your rebirth is based upon how you acted in a past life. You are where you are today because of who you were and what you did and what you said. And that is who you are. It also means that you have a chance now to affect your future. It does give you a certain amount of freedom. So you can do things to affect your rebirth or even to affect this life. And so to do good which, of course, is encouraged in these traditions, means that your life will become better. All right? It's very simple. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And so it is into that context that the Buddha is born. However, I mean, this may sound really great and may sound coherent, and it's kind of a beautiful justice system. You know, everybody gets what they deserve. But it was a problem, even from the very beginning. Uh, the Hindus and the Buddhists along with them did not see rebirth as a desirable thing. Okay, this is the hard thing, I think, for Westerners to get a grasp on. You know, I talk to my students. I say, well, you know, this is what it's like, and this is a, a problem in Hindu and Buddhist theology. And they say, why is it a problem? I'd love to come back, you know? And I say, yeah, if you keep coming back as a Rhodes student, you know, as an upper middle class, wealthy, privileged individual, yeah, it'd be great, wouldn't it? But the problem is it's not the way it works. You know, you're more likely to come back as a bug than you are as a road student. That's just the way it is. And, but the good news is this, and, and the Dalai Lama is always talking about it. He says, listen, this is a precious human birth. And what he means is we've all worked very hard to get to this point, Right? Uh, it takes a long time to become a human being. And being a human is the best being to be. It's better, of course, than being a bug or a dog or any kind of animal. It's even better than being a god. Because at the human level, we have the greatest opportunity to change our future, to change our karma. Gods have no interest in doing it. Gods live lives that are too pleasurable. And animals live lives that's too full of suffering and they don't get a chance to uh, change their karma as much. And so to be a human being means we can affect our future. We can do something about it, and that's why it's great. Well, what do we need to do? According to the ancient Indians, what we need to do is to stop this rebirth. It's unfortunate. It is undesirable. It is not a situation that we want. Uh, it is uh, an endless cycle of suffering. Now, you know, we can think about, oh, it'd be nice to come back, but think about doing this all the time. Think about every life you'd have to live. As I tell my students, I said, imagine what it would be like to keep having to go through middle school over and over again. That's what samsara is, you know. So that was the problem. And people all over began to wonder, 
what do we do about this? How are we going to fix this problem? And so this spawned this great creative philosophical and religious movement of trying to find a way to end samsara. And a whole movement of people, I'm talking about not just scores, I mean thousands of people, men and women, people of all castes and classes, left their homes, quit their jobs, and went off into the forest to become monks and nuns and hermits, trying to figure out the answer to this question. In fact, it got to be a real problem uh, because there was no one left to do the work and to raise the families. And so the, the Hindus actually had to institute a, a kind of uh, stage of life system which told people that at the earliest stage of, of life, they have to be householders. Well, they have to be students first. Then they get married and become householders, and they have to raise a family, and they have to contribute to the good of society. And then when they become old, then they can go off to the forest and figure out the meaning of life and all these other kinds of things. So, you know, by the time you're retired, uh, you're pretty useless to society. <laughs> and... Why not let you deal with your religious issues in that way? That was the idea. So, and it was, you know, they didn't need social security because what you did was you just renounced everything. You became a wanderer, a sannyasin, they call them. So you, and, and you still see them today in India. They're all over the place. They wear these orange robes, and, and they're just men and women who wander without a home, without a name, without connection. They have renounced everything, and what they're trying to do is to seek their connection to the divine, or their liberation from samsara. And that's what this whole movement was all about. Well, needless to say, lots of different ideas were proposed about how you do this, and uh, many uh, teachings have come down to us that, that give us answers to it. And the Buddha happened to be one of these individuals who came across an answer, he thought, to ending samsara, to ending the suffering that we have in life. wasn't the only answer, it was one of many, uh, but it was an answer that many people found very attractive. Okay, so let's get back to the Buddha. This was his context. He's uh, an individual who lives uh, during this time of great spiritual upheaval. And so we want to know what we can say about this individual from a historical standpoint. And as I said, this is not something that most Buddhists would be terribly interested in, but uh, Western scholars are. And so I'm going to present to you what it is we can say about the Buddha from a historical perspective. And I'm using this image right here. Does anybody recognize it? What is it? Who said they understood it? Yes, uh, Ambion. Uh, in Afghanistan, there was a huge image of the Buddha that was there that was destroyed by the Taliban about 10 years ago. They got dynamite, blew it up, because they were radical Islamists, and they thought this was an idol. And so the best thing they thought to do was to blow it up. I mean, it was a terrible thing, great outrage you know, uh, across the world about this sort of thing. Uh, it didn't bother me. Uh, and I don't think it bothered most Buddhists either, because one of the things that you know in Buddhism, one of its principal foundations is things change, and resisting change is why we suffer. Okay, But the reason I use the image here is because there's an empty space, and that in a way is kind of metaphorical for what it is we can say about the Buddha. Not much at all. All right, We can say this much, and I think this much is pretty certain, that at a time, you know, in the 5th century BCE, a young man who was a member of the warrior caste became a samana. A samana is a word used for one of these ascetics who go off into the forest to try to find liberation. And that's what he did. And he probably did what a lot of samanas do and do today. Uh, that is, uh, cover themselves in ashes. These are ashes from the cremation grounds. They practice fasting. They practice all kinds of austerities that I won't even describe to you because it's kind of early in the morning, and uh, I don't think you want to hear about some of the things that they did, but that's the thing that the Buddha did. He did what a lot of young people were doing, and old people too at this time. So 
he may have looked just like this or something like it. Uh, this is a picture I think I took uh, about two years ago of an individual living in the same area where the Buddha lived uh, 2,500 years ago. He studied intensely, and after uh, a period of study, he believed he had found the answer that he's looking for. And he established what was called a dhamma, or to use the uh, Sanskrit term, a dharma. You may have heard this word, dharma, a uh, very rich term in uh, Hinduism and Buddhism, kind of is close to what Christians would mean by the gospel. You know, that liberating teaching that uh, brings us salvation. That's what a dharma is. And the Buddha had his dharma, and lots of individuals had their dharma. And so he taught this dharma to uh, a group of people who would listen to him. There were lots who would. Uh, many of them were these uh, samanas, just like he was. Many of them were just Householders, ordinary people. And he gathered a following. He started a community called the Sangha, which would be comparable to a church in Christianity, but, but a lot less organized. Uh, it's very localized. Uh, and he lived out his days till he was 80 years old. And then he died. And that's about all we can say with historical certainty about the life of the Buddha. Now, that's not a lot to build a religion on. Okay, And so Buddhists coming in the wake of the Buddha, long after he had died, began to augment the story, as people do. Uh, whenever there's a charismatic individual, they began to sort of fill in the gaps and make the story more interesting and make the story more dramatic. And it's actually that story that I find most interesting because it's that story of what I call the Buddha of myth that really embodies for us what he taught. So it was as if the Buddha was living out his own teaching in this way, which is something I believe uh, it's part of my philosophy of education, that really what I teach my students is something they're going to forget. But what they're going to remember is who I am. And apparently somebody remembers me as uh, assigning weird readings with uh, pointless ideas to them. So uh, not exactly what I wanted them to remember, but... <laughs> But that's what they remember, apparently. So, you know, you, people go to college, they probably forget 90% of what it was that they, they learned. But uh, they do remember the teacher. And that's what uh, the followers of the Buddha remembered. He impressed them with his person a great deal. And they created the story uh, about his life that is much richer than the one I just told you. And in calling it a myth, I don't mean to say it's wrong or it's false. I'm just saying it's not historically verifiable. We don't know if it's true or not, but it's certainly much more interesting. Now, I have an image here of the Buddha. Uh, I want to make sure you recognize that person as the Buddha and that you're not under the impression that this guy is the Buddha because a lot of Westerners think this is the Buddha. This is not the Buddha. <laughs> this is a Chinese folk god who has the unfortunate name of Buddhai, or in Japanese, Hotai. And he's been incorporated into the Buddhist and Confucian system and Chinese folk religion and so forth. But a lot of people have this idea that the Buddha is some fat, jolly guy. Uh, that's not him at all. And if you rub his belly, you get good luck. I mean, that, that's all superstition. And I think the Buddha himself would be appalled at that idea. So don't think this is the Buddha. But the mythic life of the Buddha begins long before the life of Siddhartha Gautama. And this is why we can't verify it historically. Okay, there is uh, a whole genre of literature that tells us about the previous lives of the Buddha, who he was in his past lives. Now, interestingly, the Buddha never talked about his past lives. And I, and I ought to say this because I don't believe the Buddha taught samsara. I don't believe he taught rebirth. Now, most Buddhists believe in rebirth. I assure you that. Okay? I don't. I don't believe in rebirth. I think the idea of rebirth actually goes against Buddhist principles. But the Buddha lived in a world where everybody believed rebirth. I think the Buddha was agnostic about it. He also never said to people, you've got to be believe in rebirth in order to be a Buddhist. He never, ever said that. In fact, he said a few things which said, don't be so worried about 
what's going to happen in your past life or what's going to happen in your future life. The thing that matters is here and now. And it's that idea of Buddhism that I find very attractive. But Buddhist followers wanted to, you know, make the story more dramatic and more interesting. So they started creating stories about his previous lives. And interestingly, these stories had to do with times when he lived as an animal. Okay, so they're a lot like Aesop's fables. Uh, and they are told to children uh, for bedtime stories. And you can buy these comic books like this. And they're great stories. My daughter used to love them. I'd read them to her every night, you know. And they always had a little moral to them, just like uh, an Aesop story. And they were always about the life of the Buddha and how he did this and helped these animals. And sometimes he was a monkey, sometimes a turtle, sometimes a... Uh, um, I can't even think, a rabbit, those sorts of things. And so the story is that he had thousands, hundreds of thousands of lifetimes. One thing you ought to know about uh, the rebirth idea is it has no beginning. There's never a time when we were not being reborn. And this is something that boggles people's mind. The same thing is true about the universe. The universe has always existed, according to Hinduism. Uh, it just always has been, and we, our souls, have always been on this cycle of rebirth. Okay, so Buddhism adopts that. That's just part of the worldview. So the story starts off. Now it gets much more interesting when it specifies a particular previous life of the Buddha at a time when this guy who ultimately became Siddhartha Gotama lived his life as a monk by the name of Sumedha. And Sumedha happened to see another Buddha from another world system, as the Buddhists call it, and decided he was so impressed with this individual that he himself would become a Buddha. And he made this vow to be a Buddha. And so already I'm telling you there are lots of Buddhas in the world. Uh, and our Buddha, the Buddha of our world system, is Siddhartha Gautama. But he lived many, many lifetimes before that. He made this vow, and by taking this vow, he said, I'm going to practice, I'm going to work hard, I'm going to do what it takes to clear myself of all this negative karma and become a perfect individual. That's one of the terms used for a Buddha, a perfect one. And so he practices this over and over again, lifetime after lifetime. And this is probably the way most Buddhists live their lives today. Most Buddhists are not interested in getting liberation or nirvana from samsara at this moment. That's something for a future lifetime. But they're going to work hard to improve their rebirth so that it will be easier next time. They get that much closer. So it takes thousands of lifetimes to do this. In his penultimate life, in the life he lived right before he was uh, born for the last time, he was living in a heaven called Tusita as a god, and uh, even gods die, according to this South Asian worldview. So gods are not all powerful. They have great powers, to be sure. And they live long, 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 long lives. But still they die. They exhaust their karma. And they have to be reborn. And so when it came time to be reborn, this individual who had ultimately made this vow to be the Buddha said, I've got to be reborn on uh, the human plane again. This is my last rebirth. I'm going to be a Buddha. He looks on earth. He finds this place called Jambu Dwipa, which is a place where there are a lot of virtuous people. We today know it as India. And he decides he's going to be reborn there. He chooses these two people as his parents, uh, King Sudodana and Queen Mahamaya, because they were very pious and righteous individuals. And so he chooses to be born a prince from this king and queen. Now, probably the real Buddha was not a prince. He was probably just a warrior in the warrior caste. His parents may have been wealthy, uh, but he was definitely not royalty. And the reason we know that is because there were no kings or queens in India at this time. Uh, so we know that's kind of an exaggeration. But it's an important point to make. Uh, and I'm going to tell you why I think it's important a little bit later on, why the Buddhists have made the Buddha into a prince. Okay, so let me just stop here. I'm see if you've got any questions while I take a sip. Okay. I want to say something that's kind of interesting about 
about samsara. You know, the, the Dalai Lama and uh, Buddhists in the Tibetan tradition, once they have attained a certain kind of state of enlightenment, can choose their rebirth. Uh, you may not know this about the Dalai Lama, but he is a realized individual. He is a, considered like a living Buddha. And yet he keeps coming back to life. Our current Dalai Lama has been reborn 14 different times uh, in this particular world system. And he can choose how he comes back. And the current Dalai Lama has told a lot of people that he is not going to be reborn uh, after he dies. Of course, he's approaching death. And uh, to make sure that doesn't happen, the Chinese government just passed a law this year saying that no Buddhist monk can reincarnate without the permission of the Chinese government. <laughs> and the reason for that is because China and Tibet have been uh, kind of at loggerheads for centuries, and the Chinese do not like having the Buddha, I'm sorry, the Dalai Lama, kind of representing the Chinese people, being an alternative uh, head of state, really, which is what he is, and they don't want to do that. And they're, they're actually lamas now, whom the Tibetan Buddhists have said, this is our lama, and the Chinese government says, no, you're wrong, this is the lama. Uh, so there's a lot of intrigue and political discussion going on about that. So I think the Chinese have gotten a good solution to the problem here. You know, you just got to make sure you get their permission uh, to do this. So, and, but at any rate, uh, the, the Buddha you know, in his penultimate life as a deva, was able to choose his parents and the place of his rebirth, and he chose these two individuals. Uh, there's a story about how he was conceived, which is a very interesting one, uh, because of its parallels with the, the story of uh, the virgin birth. So his mother, Mahamaya, was having a dream, and she dreamed of a white elephant god, and uh, that God entered her side, and at that moment, she conceived. Now, there is no indication here that this was a virgin birth. They're not saying that. Uh, but they are saying that this was a divinely intended kind of birth, so that there was the intention of the heavenly realm that was behind this, not that this was some kind of uh, birth that was affected without, uh, uh, you know, the how should I put it, the agency of a male uh, partner. Uh, compare that, of course, to the conception of Jesus, uh, where the Virgin Mary uh, is visited by an angel and uh, who announces her birth, and yet the birth is uh, one that is uh, divinely conceived. And I think it's kind of interesting to sort of look at these two pictures together, uh, and you see sort of the structural parallels between them, uh, you know, both involve white animals coming down and uh, a, a conception taking place and uh, individuals, uh, in particular women, who are kind of on the sides watching all of this happen. So uh, it's, a, it's a similarity uh, between the two. There's apparently no relationship between them historically. It's just kind of one of those interesting coincidences that we have. His mom was uh, pregnant for 10, year, uh, 10 months. Boy, that would have been terrible, wouldn't it? 10 months. And uh, she was uh, deciding to go and visit her parents uh, in another town. And she was on her way there. And she felt uh, that it was time to deliver the child. And she said, I want to rest in this garden in a place called Lumbini. And she went there and she reached up to a branch in the tree. And immediately the Buddha left her side. This is how he emerged from her body. And he came into the world, according to the text, in full awareness. And he took seven steps, represented by these seven lotuses under his feet, and said, I have come to the world for the good of humanity. This will be my last rebirth. So full consciousness, speaking, um, all of those sorts of things, kind of a miraculous birth obviously. Uh, and in some ways, you know, there's stories uh, in the Gnostic Gospels about Jesus doing the same thing, you know, speaking in the manger and, and things like that, or even having a full consciousness. But this is the story. Uh, Mahamaya experienced no pain whatsoever. She was just there. She gave birth, and you can see she's kind of smiling after it's over. Uh, and all around are the gods. 
These are the gods that you see up in the blue sky. Uh, they are the Hindu gods, but the Buddhists don't think of them as Hindu gods. They just think of them as the gods. And uh, they are kind of anointing this or, or showing their approval of this event by sprinkling uh, flowers all over the place. So this was the birth of the Buddha. It was a miraculous birth. Uh, and then uh, the child is taken back to the palace, a place called Kapilavatu in Nepal. And the first thing they do is the first thing virtually any South Asian parents do when a child is born, and that is they call in the astrologers. And they get the charts done, and they want to know what's this kid going to be like, and what should we name him. And almost every Hindu and Buddhist that I know does this sort of thing. You can do it online, um, <laughs> which makes it a lot easier because we did it with my daughter too, you know. Just and my wife puts a lot of stock in this sort of thing. Uh, for the record, I don't, uh, but uh, she thought this is you know the thing to do. You know, what's this person going to be like? What should we name her and everything? And so that's exactly what. Uh, Sudodana and uh, Mahamaya did. They called in Asita, who was the best astrologer in the realm. He took the boy, and uh, in addition to doing his charts, he looked at his body, and he was able to see certain markings on his body that were the marks of what he called a Mahamaya, or Mahaparusha, that is, a, a great human being. And the first thing he noticed was his feet. They were flat and they had these little circles on them. Now this is one of the things that endears me to Buddhism. Maybe the reason I started practicing Buddhism in the first place is because I got flat feet <laughs> that look just like that. So, um, and uh, they noticed too, they had blue eyes. Hey, I got blue eyes, all right? And so um, this was another feature that marked him as a Mahamaya. He had long arms, uh, as you can see. The one is missing here. Um, these are things that were ultimately brought out in the iconography about the Buddha. You know, this is one thing that's kind of interesting. For 500 years after the death of the Buddha, no images were ever made of him. Now, today, the Buddha image is the most common image in the world of anyone or anything, most common. And yet, for 500 years, these images were not made. And you know where they started being made first? Afghanistan. Uh -huh, yeah, the very place where they're being destroyed right now. So, and they were being produced under the uh, influence of Greek art because Alexander the Great had moved into Afghanistan. He brought with him these Greek art designs. And so the first images of the Buddha look like Apollo. Yeah, it's very interesting. So the Buddha also had a deep, resonant voice, a uh, beautiful voice. Uh, he had what's called an urna right here, kind of like the third eye, except it wasn't a marking like a lot of Hindu women wear today. It was a tuft of hair that was growing. Now, this is one of those images I was talking about. This is one of the first images of the Buddha, and it looks a lot like Apollo. It looks very Greek in its styling. He had a golden body, uh, and he had long earlobes. Okay, and these are some of the things that you can use to distinguish uh, a Buddha image. So uh, there are a lot of images of people that look a lot like the Buddha, but you can tell if it's a Buddha if they have this certain kind of hairdo, this kind of thing on the top of the head, long earlobes, the urna, various things. Not all Buddha images have all of these things, but they have many of them. And based upon these things that Asita saw, he predicted that this boy, this prince, would be either a great ruler, a, a, a great emperor, or he would become a great sage, a person who would help people in their spiritual lives. And that was the prediction. He didn't know which one it was. Uh, the father, being the king, says, well, you know, I'd really like my son to follow in my footsteps and not become a religious fanatic. So is there anything I can do to keep him from becoming this sage? And uh, Asita said, well, yeah, you just uh, keep him sort of sheltered. 
and locked up and make sure his life is totally pleasant, that he doesn't see any suffering in the world, that he uh, is only surrounded by the most beautiful people, uh, that he lives a, a life of ease and comfort and luxury, and sure enough, he's going to follow in your footsteps and become this great emperor. And that's what Sudodana said, I'm going to do that. Unfortunately, the Buddha's mother died after he was only seven days old. We're not really sure why, uh, but she was reborn in heaven, which was kind of her reward for giving birth to the Buddha. He was raised then by the king's other wife, who happened to be Mahamaya's sister, and her name was Queen Perjapati. And King Siddha Odina says, okay, we're going to just make this guy's life as pleasant as possible. And they basically kept him a prisoner in the palace. Uh, so he stayed in the palace all the time, was never allowed to go out of the palace. Uh, he was surrounded by young, beautiful people. He ate the best food. Uh, and the stories just really pile it on about how great this guy was. He was a wonderful athlete. Uh, it kind of reminds me of some of the stories that are often told about uh, Kim Jong Un. Uh, if you're familiar with all of that about how great he is, and you know he just can't do no wrong. He's a great athlete. He's a great horseman. He was a great scholar. Uh, he was beautiful. Uh, he was so beautiful that he got married at age 16 to his cousin Yashodara. Uh, they had it all. They had the wealth. They had the power he was going to become emperor. Uh, there was just really nothing more you could add to the story. As I think about it, you know, I think, what more could they add to the story to make it seem like this guy had it all? And then I realized that's the point of the story. And it's also one of the points of Buddhism. Because Buddhism says having it all is not enough. You can have everything you think you want. And that's what the Buddha had. He has everything by virtue of being born. He has everything we think we want. Power, fame, good looks, intelligence, athletic prowess, uh, luxury galore, great food, just everything, on and on and on. And yet it's still not enough because having been born into this situation, the Buddha is still unsatisfied. And so he decides He's got to do something about this. And this is one of the things that makes this story so interesting and so great, I think, is that it's one of the few stories in our world that is a riches to rags story. Everything else is rags to riches. You know? um, Rocky Balboa, Cinderella, you know, all these stories. We love these stories as Americans, right? You know, somebody starts off in humble circumstances, they work really hard, and they get everything they want. The Buddha had everything he wanted, and he had to work hard to get rid of it. And that's what he ultimately did. And that was really the message of Buddhism, right there. You know, you can have everything you want, and it's still not going to be enough. As I often tell my daughter, there is no end to desire. It does not end. So the Buddha lived with his wife in his gilded cage, until he was age 29, and uh, he ultimately got tired of it. And he said, you know, I, I know there's something more to the world than all this finery and luxury and all this good stuff. And so he conspired with a friend of his to go out and see the world as it really was. And they had to kind of sneak around to do this because his father kind of kept him trapped, imprisoned, wouldn't let him out. Uh, and so he and a friend snuck out one night or four different nights, depending on the story you read, and the Buddha saw, but he's not called the Buddha at this time, he's known as Siddhartha. Siddhartha sees things he'd never seen before. And in the first picture you can see, um, what is that? Uh, it looks like a, is that an old man? Yeah, an old man up there walking with a cane. And the Buddha looks at him and says, what's wrong with this guy? Why has he got gray hair? Why has he got wrinkles? Why has he bent over and using a stick? And his friends said, well, he's old. And the Buddha, the Siddhartha said, what? You, is that something that just happens to him or does it happen to other people? And he said, well, if you live long enough, it happens to everyone. And the Siddhartha said, what? You mean it's going to happen to me? 
it, here it gets a little kind of funny, you know, uh, the, the story does. It's like, what, really? It's going to happen to me? And he said, yes, sire, you live along now. This is going to happen to you. That troubled him. And then he goes along, the next thing he sees is a sick person. And uh, this is something, according to the legends, he had never seen before. He says, what's wrong with this guy? He says, well, he's sick. Does this only happen to him, or does it happen to other people? Well, it happens to everybody. Will it happen to me? You know, and he gets reassured, yes, it's going to happen to you. And then the one that really bothered him was the dead body that he saw. And by the way, you can see dead bodies everywhere you go in India. Uh, it's hard to avoid them. Uh, and so he sees the body being burned on the pyre, and he's wondering what's going on. He says, he's dead. Is that going to happen to me? Yes. And he's 29 years old. And I'm thinking to myself, <laughs> what 29-year-old does not know about these things? Are you telling me he never even lost a goldfish or his puppy never died? or I mean, something, I mean, never encountered death, never saw the whole thing. It was a little incredulous, I think. And I thought about this a long time. And then I realized, I think there is a reason behind this story. Now, the Buddha himself never said this happened. Uh, this is part of the mythology. But I'm wondering, why did the Buddhist add this? And here's what I think. I think the Buddha knew about these things. I think he knew about sickness and old age and death. You know, my daughter knows about them. She's known about them since she was very, very young. But here's the difference. She doesn't think they pertain to her. And this is why I think the age of 29 is significant in this story. Uh, I don't know about you, but the, the time I started realizing I was getting old was right about that time when I was 30 years old. I looked in the mirror for the first time, and I thought, oh, God, this isn't happening. <laughs> and I denied it, you know, and then I said, well, I can cover this up. I began finally to accept it. And I tell you what, the, the real problem for me was... I didn't think it should happen to me. You know, I knew in the abstract it happens, but it always happens to other people. It doesn't happen to me. I'm going to keep my youthful appearance all my life, you know. And I knew about death. You know, my students know about death. They just don't think it's going to happen to them. Okay? At age 29, the realities begin to set in. And I think that's what happened to Siddhartha. He began to realize, yes, indeed, this pertains to me. This is my business. And that was what really set him on his spiritual quest. I think this often happens, we see it all throughout the history of religions, where people began their spiritual quest with a traumatic experience. Uh, it could be the death of a loved one, a death of a parent. This often happens. Uh, today it might be a divorce or losing a job or something like that. But it usually takes something traumatic to shake you from your dogmatic slumber and you begin to wonder what's going on. I call this the Buddha's first awakening. We'll talk in a moment about his second awakening, which was under the, the tree. But without this first awakening, there'd be no second awakening. He had to come to realize these are the facts of life. The fourth thing he saw was a Samana. That's, again, one of these ascetics who's wandering out in northern India trying to figure out what the meaning of life is and how to end samsara. And the thing that impressed him most about the Samana was this guy was happy. He had a smile on his face. You can see he's dressed up there in an orange robe, which is what Buddhist monks still wear today. And he's smiling, content. And the Buddha was astounded. Wait a second. This is a world full of anguish and suffering and illness and death. And how is this guy happy? And he said, I've got to figure out what he's got. I've got to get this thing that he's got. And so he decided to leave his wife and son and the palace and his parents and all that good stuff in the middle of the night. And he left them all and said goodbye to them. Now, I think that's, that's an impressive thing. I, I would find it hard to do if I had all the stuff that the Buddha did, to sort of give it all up and to start on this kind of quest. Uh, thank God I didn't have it all, that I would have to give it all up. Uh, that would be a tough thing to do. But he did. He was that serious about what it was. And so he left in the middle of the night, took his horse, uh, and crossed a river. And by the way, this river is always a symbol of 
Christians ought to know this, baptism, anytime you read about rivers in literature, especially religious literature, it means a transformation. It means a death and a rebirth, just as in uh, Christian interpretation of baptism. So he crosses this river, he finds another Samana, he trades clothes with this guy, he cuts off his long hair, which was symbolic of his royal status, and he begins the life of an ascetic wandering around trying to figure it out. His first desire was to find a teacher. He needed to find someone. There were plenty of people there. He went to the best yoga teachers around because there was a lot of experimentation going on at this time. And he found a guy that he thought was really good and he studied with him and he learned it all so quickly. And at the end of his apprenticeship, he said, this is still not what I want. Still not enough. So he leaves that teacher and he goes and finds another one who's supposed to be even higher, more advanced, he studies with him. He learns it all very quickly, and it's still not enough. And he says, you know, I think I've had it with teachers. I've studied with the best. They can't teach me anything about the best thing I can do is to study on my own. So he gives up teachers and goes off and looks for himself to try to find a way to end his suffering. And the first thing he did was to practice some of that extreme asceticism that we talked about. Now, you saw that picture of Hotai, the big fat Buddha. This is more like the Buddha. Okay, and this is how you'll find the Buddha depicted in India, skin and bones. Uh, and that's the story. I mean, he was so zealous about practicing this. Uh, they said, in fact, he said that you could kind of grab his spine through his belly. Uh, and see his ribs. He looked dead. His skin had gotten dark. His eyes had sunken in. People actually thought he was dead uh, as he was sitting there. Uh, he fasted. He only took a grain of rice a day, and for moisture, he'd suck off a little uh, dew that had collected on a leaf. Here's an image of his back uh, from the same picture, so you can see the veins through it. I mean, it's to really kind of accentuate his extremism, in a way. He was uh, somebody who was really going to find it. But you know what? At some point he said to himself, you know, the reason I started this practice is because I wanted to end suffering. This is not the way to end suffering. <laughs> uh, when you think about it, I'm suffering a lot more this way. I'm going to die. This is not what I want. So he began to think about it. You know, what is it that I really need? And he begins to realize, you know, I have been an extremist all my life. I've gone from this life in the palace where I had everything I could possibly want to this life as an ascetic where I had nothing at all. Now maybe there's a happy medium somewhere. It just so happens he was sitting by a river and some musician was playing this instrument to kind of... Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, to teach his students uh, how to play this uh, stringed instrument. And he's telling them, he says, don't tighten the string too much or it'll break and don't keep it too slack or it won't play at all. Find that medium, find that middle way. And that became uh, a metaphor for the Buddha. He said, yeah, that must be the way. I will avoid these extremes of overindulgence on the one hand or extreme asceticism on the other. And so he began to eat. He was given food by a uh, little village girl by the name of Sujita, who offered him some milk rice. It restored his health. By the way, if you've got that um, program that has my picture on it, that picture was taken at the place that Buddhists believe that Sujita offered uh, this rice to the Buddha. It's a little village in northeastern India that I visited a couple of years ago. Uh, and that tree is now covered with flags. Maybe you can see the prayer flags in the background, that tree, I don't know. Um, and so he decides to take nourishment, not too much, not too little, just what he needs to sustain health. And when this happened, he had some followers, some students who said, ah, you've deviated from the path, we're going to leave. These were hardcore ascetics. And they said, you, you, you've given up the path. You can't teach us anymore. And so they left where he was, and they went to a place called uh, Benares, uh, a holy city in India. And so he was left alone, didn't have students, didn't have anyone. 
and he went to a town called Bodh Gaya, a place you can visit today, uh, still a very important pilgrimage site in uh, Buddhism. He found a tree called a Bodhi tree or a people tree uh, that uh, the daughter tree is still there. Uh, this is not the original tree, but a tradition says it's growing on the same place and it was propagated from the original tree of uh, the Buddha. And a lot of Buddhists go there today. He sat under this tree. Uh, it has very distinctive leaves like this and this image is often used uh, in Buddhist iconography here. And he sat and he says, I am not leaving this place till I get enlightened. And he begins to go through his practices of meditation. And when that happens, he begins to have all kinds of interesting experiences. Uh, one of the first things that occurs is that an individual appears to him by the name of Mara. And Mara is the Buddhist equivalent of Satan. I don't mean Satan as the god of evil. I mean Satan as the tempter. And you know the story of the temptations of Jesus where he goes up uh, to Mount Temptation. He's up there for 40 days and nights. And Buddha, I mean, the, and the Satan is trying to tell Jesus, you know, throw yourself down off the temple, turn this uh, rock into bread, that kind of stuff. Trying to deter Jesus from his path. That's exactly what Mara did. He tried to scare the Buddha. He, he frightened him with armies. He frightened him with arrows pointing to him. Uh, his ultimate thing was to uh, create this illusion of voluptuous women who are dancing and playing music and trying to get the Buddha to sort of uh, give up his path and, and sort of follow his lust. But he was too dedicated at this point for that to happen, and Mara just disappeared. And so the Buddha continued to meditate, and through the night he came to a deeper understanding of the nature of reality. And by morning, as the uh, sun begins to rise, and, th and this, this is all beautiful iconography. It's a lot like the resurrection of Jesus, which happens right at dawn, you know, on a Sunday morning. So this is right at dawn. He comes to the awareness that he has been awakened. And that's what the word, the Buddha, means. The Buddha is the awakened one. He has seen the world as it is. So I said the Buddha was a title. It means the awakened one, one who sees the world as it is. It also means one who has ended suffering and rebirth. And that is known as Nibbana, or we know it as Nirvana. And it is the moment at which the Dhamma comes into the world, essentially. And he has done what it is that he needs to do. And he becomes, at this point, the Buddha. And that's what people call him. The Buddha is not a god. He's a human being, uh, but an extraordinary human being who has sort of actualized human potential. That is what is so important about the Buddha. Now, I mentioned to you earlier, there's another Buddha. There are actually thousands, millions of Buddhas in previous you know, world systems. Uh, a Buddha is just someone who discovers the Dhamma on his own and teaches it to others. And our Buddha, for our age, for our era, is Siddhartha Gautama, or he's sometimes called Gautama Buddha or Shakyamuni Buddha, all kinds of different names. So that is our guy. And he decides after sitting there for about 49 days that he's going to go out and teach people this Dhamma that he has learned. Uh, at first, he didn't want to do it because he thought, you know, nobody's going to listen to me. Nobody can understand this. And then, according to the legend, a god appears to him and says, you know, there's some people out there who have just a little dust in their eyes. You know, th they'll be receptive to what it is you have to say if you will do it. And so, out of compassion for the world, according to the Buddhist tradition, he goes and teaches others. He first goes back to his uh, yoga teachers, but they had recently died, so then he goes and finds his five followers who had repudiated him and left him, and he finds them in a deer park in a place called Sarnat, right outside of Baranasi. And if you go there, uh, you can still see the deer. They're still living. They're cute little deer, about this tall. And uh, it is now, of course, uh, a pilgrimage site, but it's there uh, where the Buddha gave his first sermon. And after hearing this sermon, all five of these individuals began to 
gain enlightenment. They gained enlightenment by listening to him. And they became the nucleus of the Sangha. And uh, here are the places in Sarnath today that you could visit. The Sangha begins to grow, this community, because people are eager to hear it. And uh, so it is created as a consequence of it. He goes back to his home. He meets his parents who've now gotten older. Uh, he meets his wife. They all become Buddhist monks and nuns. His mother becomes the first Buddhist nun. Uh, his wife becomes a nun. Even his son became a nun. This is his son, Rahula, who had grown up a little bit. I, this is always an endearing picture to me because there is Rahula. You see what he's doing? He's on the lap of the Buddha. Now, remember, he's never met his father before. He's got his hand like this. You know what he's asking for? What did you bring me? <laughs> this is what my daughter's going to say to me tonight. What did you bring me from your trip? And the Buddha says, I'm sorry, I don't have anything to give you, but I can give you the Dhamma. I can give you the most precious thing in the world. And so Rahula became a monk and followed uh, the path of the Buddha. Uh, there are all kinds of other stories after this, but I've told you the main stuff. Some of the interesting stories are the assassination attempts on the Buddha. Uh, he had a cousin named Devadatta who was so jealous of him he tried, uh, David Otto was a Buddhist monk too, but uh, he didn't like the Buddha getting so popular, so he tried to kill him. Uh, one thing he was trying to do, as you can see in this picture, is push a boulder off a cliff, you know, and the Buddha's walking around, you know, very calmly, you know, like this and everything. He knows everything that's going on. And he senses the boulder's about to come, so he stops just as <laughs> crashes up here, and he looks up at David Otto and kind of, Shakes his head because the worst thing in the world to do is to kill a Buddha or to attempt to kill a Buddha. They're basically the same thing. He said, David Dada, you don't know what you've done. Uh, didn't deter David Dada. He tried it again. He got an elephant drunk and had to, the elephant charge at the Buddha, uh, thinking he was going to stomp him to death. The Buddha just kind of stood there, you know, very peacefully. And the Buddha stopped, and the elephant stopped right before he charged, and the Buddha just kind of patted his trunk just like this and went on his way. So these are all those stories trying to talk about, in very dramatic form, the virtues of Buddhism. You know, the kinds of things that a Buddhist, someone who follows in this path, are supposed to do. The Buddha died at age 80. It was a very peaceful death. He um, actually got food poisoning. And uh, he knew he was going to die. Uh, it was a two-week process, and he had his followers sort of set him between two trees. Uh, and notice how often trees appear in this story. You know, his mother's holding on to his tree. He's enlightened under a tree, and now he dies under a tree. Trees are very prominent in uh, the spiritual traditions uh, throughout the world. Uh, Jesus dies on a tree, for instance. Uh, and so he dies a very peaceful death. And this is what's known as his parinibbana. His nirvana, his nibbana, comes when he's enlightened, when he's awakened at 35. But his parinibbana, or his final nibbana, comes when he dies. And it means, essentially, that he's no longer born again. He has completely ended his suffering. And that's where I'm going to leave it at this moment. So uh, how am I doing on time? Do we? And if you have questions, I'll be up here. You can talk to me about it, too.